I occasionally mock Street Fighter 4, but I do like the game, especially the Ultra update. And I still play it from time to time to be social. The complete package is greater than the sum of its parts. But some of those parts still get on my nerves, and the biggest sticking point for me is the Ultra Meter. When I first saw the Super Meter and the Ultra Meter in Street Fighter 4, I was pretty excited. At first glance, I thought something that I'm sure everyone else did at the time. Clearly, this is inspired by Dimps' own fighting game series, The Rumblefish, published by Sammy and released on the Atomus Wave exclusively in Japan, which had two meters for offensive and defensive moves, and this is clearly making some use of that. You know, that old chestnut, you probably heard it a dozen times as soon as the first teaser dropped, if you're old enough at the time. I mean, that was over 10 years ago. Anyway, when I discovered that Dimps actually helped Capcom develop this game in some capacity, I was pretty excited. Rumblefish 2 was a solid game overall, so I assumed that Dimps would make a great Street Fighter game after one or two tries, just like they did with Rumblefish as a series. But when Street Fighter 4 came out, I was a bit disappointed in it. While it was a good game in general, and fit together well aesthetically, and say what you will about your own taste, but every update and addition to the Street Fighter 4 roster has a consistent look, even the stuff that trickled over from Street Fighter Cross Tekken. While it was aesthetically consistent, not every aspect of it gelled together in terms of gameplay. Like its emphasis on burst damage on the one hand, and its heavy scaling for damage, stun, and meter gain on the other, which would hit 50% between 4-6 to six hits based on the moves you used just to give a quick example, I don't want to make a whole laundry list of complaints, I just wanted to give an example of asymmetry within Street Fighter 4 itself, without any comparisons to any other games. And the thing that really highlighted that asymmetry was Dimps' own involvement with the game, because they made the Rumblefish 2, and one of the strengths of the Rumblefish 2 is how well everything comes together in that game. The first Rumblefish had potential, and the bulk of it was simply reused for its sequel, except its super meter which was made up of two big super meters for offense and defense, layered right on top of each other. Blocking or being hit by attacks increased the defense meter, and attacking increased the offense meter. The defense meter could be used for defensive moves, like guard cancelling or parrying, while the offense meter was used for offensive moves, like untackable juggles and cancelling normal attacks. And each meter could be used for a defensive or offensive super move, respectively, or a critical art, a special super move using both meters with lower damage scaling. It was a good system as is, but it had issues. The first was that it was one long bar. It used little segments or pips to indicate how many points you had, but it was difficult to measure at a glance. The second was that using moves like the parry or juggle starter basically meant giving up the respective super, even if you had the meter for it. But those moves weren't good enough to win matches on their own, especially with the steep damage scaling that both games possessed. So players were basically taking large losses and resources to take very small gains. And that leads to the third issue, which was that there was no good reason to use a critical art. They still took big losses from damage scaling, and to use them you'd basically bar yourself from using your meter for the vast majority of the match, which just isn't practical. Now Romofish 2 fixed all that in one masterstroke by remaking the meters. Now they were segmented in thirds, and each segment was basically its own stock. So you could use one offensive bar for an offensive technique or super, one defensive bar for a defensive technique, or two of them for a defensive super, or three of each for the critical art. Critical arts were still not the most practical thing to save up for, but now there was more interplay between the meters. You could use defensive meter to set up offensive moves or offensive moves to cap off defensive play in both games, but just having more options available after spending a bit of bar in Rumblefish 2 opened up the game a lot more and I think it created better synergy for the game overall. That's not even mentioning the other stuff that was added in Rumblefish 2, but that's stuff for another time. Although, since I've got you here, I want to tell you about a great guide for Rumblefish 2 written by Al Rikir over at Al Rikir on Twitter. Apologies if I botched the name. I've only ever heard Rikir say the Rikir part. It's a solid Google Doc that compiles info shared between people who still play the game and it covers the ins and outs of the basic and advanced mechanics of the game, as well as tips and tricks for the game, such as codes for the unlockable characters, how to use the trickier mechanics, and a bunch of other stuff. I'm going to put a link to the guide in the description, as well as link to Rikir's Twitter and YouTube pages, and I encourage all of you to take a look at the guide even if you're not burning with a deep passion to play the Rumblefish 2. The YouTube page gets a plug because Rikir is also trying to make a series of guide videos called Rumble Bits. 
and regardless of how the series as a whole goes, the first episode of that and the guide already makes Rakir the number two English speaking rumble tuber on the scene. Yes, I regret that joke, but I said it so that it could die a death before someone with clout could push it into acceptance. Anyway, back to Street Fighter 4. So, the thing that always bugged me about the super and ultra meters in Street Fighter 4 is that the super meter was always subordinate to the ultra meter. Super moves scaled better, but they couldn't match the raw burst damage of ultra moves. On top of that, the super meter was the main resource for EX moves, which were far more useful and versatile, and for focus attack dash cancelling, which basically defined the game. The ultra meter, on the other hand, was only good for one thing, ultra moves, but everything else fed into that. Blocking, taking damage and using focus attacks built it up. Some EX moves could cause juggle states that could be comboed into ultras, and FADC was the universal way of hit confirming ultras. The offense was concentrated into the ultra meter, which was essentially the new super meter, and the super meter, which was essentially a separate pool for EX moves, with the option to throw away four perfectly good EX moves for a lesser super move and the defense was constrained to neutral play and praying that damage scaling would save you. Granted, defensive play in Street Fighter should be present in the footsies, in establishing boundaries and punishing poor offense, and tying that to designated mechanics would be a bit unusual even though it's been done before. But the emphasis on the ultra meter, coupled with how slow everything else was in the game at the time, put an emphasis on burst damage that I'm still uncomfortable with to this day. I did have hopes that an update to the game would do for Street Fighter 4 what the Rumblefish 2 did for Rumblefish. Capcom kind of met me halfway, I guess. Adding a further link to Street Fighter 3, Capcom introduced Ultra 2s, an alternate ultra for each character that would add some sort of alternate functionality for each character, at least on paper. They added ultra anti-airs, ultra counters, ultras that brought back old favorites like the Sonic Hurricane, or ultras that gave new types of moves to characters that were never designed for it, like Boxer getting a command throw. It was a significant update, and an interesting one, but it didn't change the lack of parity in offensive options. Super was still built off of Street Fighter 4, so all the lopsided offense was still present in Street Fighter 4. Burst damage was still the focus, and FADC into Ultra was still the best way to get burst damage, so any new Ultra moves that didn't fit into that framework was simply too inefficient to work outside of very specific matchups or lower level play, I guess, like casual, casual play, super casual play. Like even when you hit intermediate, that starts being more of an issue. Same thing applied to Red FADC in Ultra Street Fighter 4, although at least it made FADC as easy to do as it arguably should have been from the start. Funnily enough, Ultra also made a change to Ultra moves, somewhat like how Super Street Fighter 2 Turbo made supers into a mechanic. The parallel doesn't quite fit since Ultras were there from the start, but on the surface at least, it felt like Capcom was finally saying, okay, Ultras are the focus of the game, we'll, we'll freely admit that. They even added an option to use both ultras at the same time, designated by W, which of course is Japan's abbreviation for Wombo. Ultimately, while I feel like the Street Fighter 4 series has more positives than negatives, its approach to meter informs its approach to combat overall, and I think it made missteps that could have been avoided. I'm fairly sure that the focus on burst damage is something that a lot of older fighting game fans powered through, rather than something they appreciated. And while people who cut their teeth on Street Fighter 4 have no qualms with it, and it certainly didn't hurt the series' sales, I've yet to see anyone list it as a positive, just as a part of the game. Much like how Tekken fans accept wonky tracking as part of modern Tekken, or KOF fans accept Iori's fist pumps, always leading to infants. I know that Dems also helped on on Street Fighter 5, and I see a few more similarities between Rumblefish and Street Fighter 5. Street Fighter 5 has a new meter, the V meter, and both it and the super meter are now clearly segmented. Meter gain for each is very similar to what was done with Street Fighter 4, but now there are also V moves, which have character specific functions, and V triggers, which cause characters' hands and feet to glow, which automatically makes them stronger, and occasionally some characters have V triggers that do something else. Who knows? When I look at the V meter, I see a compromise between what Dimps did with Rumblefish and what Capcom and Dimps did with Street Fighter 4. The V meter is explicitly tied to defensive mechanics, but not to the extent that they were in Rumblefish. And while there's a clear hierarchy between the super meter and the V meter, it's the super meter and the super move 
that take priority in terms of damage. And the V triggers feed into the use of EX and super moves, not the other way around. I feel like this setup is more even in terms of resource management, which is probably why I spent more time with Street Fighter V in the beginning than I did with Street Fighter IV, although I ultimately didn't find it appealing enough to stick with it personally. It's not as if meter management is the most defining aspect of Street Fighter V, but I don't often see people argue over it, so I assume it's at least a point in Street Fighter V's favor amongst all of its points of contention. And that's the thing I want you to take away from this weird video of mine. Striking a balance between risk reward and resource management with meters won't single-handedly make or break a fighting game, but that balance spreads onto the flow of the game itself. And if you don't really take that into account, or if you try to force the game into a new direction without taking advantage of that or recognizing that, any effort you spend changing things about that game could be useful or it could be wasted. Yeah, really glad I needed two videos to cover all that. Solid use of my time right there. Anyway, thanks for watching.